Hey guys, welcome to Crushing COVID. I'm Richard Wolf, and tonight we are talking about how to get back to living and benefiting from the strength training lifestyle. So before we do that, we have to define what does the strength training lifestyle include. There are three pillars to the strength training lifestyle. Number one is, of course, evidence-based strength training, doing what the science says works when it comes to strength training. Number two, it's living an active lifestyle. We call this using your muscles. In your strength workout, you train your muscles, of course. When you go out and live your life and live an active lifestyle, you're basically using your muscles. And then lastly, eating sensibly. The bottom line here, guys, is that what you eat always matters when it comes to health. It matters even more when we think about your strength training and what you get out of it. So we'll dive into that as well. But those are the pillars. Evidence-based strength training, living an active lifestyle, eating sensibly. So let's look at the action steps tonight. We're going to look at how to maximize, how to get the most benefits now that we're moving back into somewhat of a normal life, training in the studio and doing things somewhat normally uh, during the shutdown. And we'll look at what are the action steps, what are the things to prioritize for you to get the most out of that as we're uh, getting back to usual, business as usual. So number one is to prioritize workout skills instead of volume. Now this is a big issue in strength training circles and it's a little bit less of an issue when you're in an environment being coached and supervised the way we do here at MedFitness, but there's always a tendency to look at your strength workout on a performance standpoint and sort of treat it like it's a competitive sport. You know where you left off, you know the weights that you were lifting, all of that of course is on your chart. We know how many repetitions you happen to get at that last weight. And so it's very easy and tempting to say, hey, I want to get the same number of reps with the same weight, even though it's been about three months since you last strength trained in the studio. That's not necessarily the best way to approach it because it doesn't focus on what we would describe as quality movement. So when I say prioritize skills, workout skills, there are four skills that we coach here at MedFitness. What are those? Number one is form. This is your posture on the exercise. The rule of thumb here, guys, is really simple. How you start the exercise, the posture that you have with your body at the beginning of an exercise is how you should look at the end of an exercise. Shifting your body, modifying your form, changing your posture to squeeze out an additional rep or two is really counterproductive for a lot of reasons. It shifts the load to other muscles. It can increase risk of injury. So number one workout skill is your form. Maintain the same form throughout the entire set. Don't modify posture as a way of squeezing out an additional repetition because it minimizes the quality of the exercise and minimizes the safety of the exercise as well. So number one, target skill number one, focus on form. Number two is of course speed. We are big advocates of training in a slow, controlled fashion here at MedFitness. Everyone who's a client of ours knows this. We have the MedFitness clock that you use to manage your speed. But what I'm going to say is the same thing I said with form. Don't change your speed as the fatigue increases just as a way of squeezing out an additional repetition or two. Again, the, the objective of the exercise is to overload the muscle, get a deep thorough fatigue of the target muscle group so that we're getting benefits from that exercise. So speeding up to get reps done is the opposite of that. Again, if we were paying you to do reps, it would make sense. If you're in a competition to do reps, it would make sense, go faster. But here the goal is safe, productive, deep stimulus to the target muscle. That is best achieved by starting slow and staying slow throughout the entire exercise. So use the med fitness clock we call it begin on time wait for those numbers 10 seconds up 10 seconds down stay on time by keeping your eyes on the clock for the entire set and again if you're not getting the reps you did last time last time you trained that's a hundred percent 
Okay, quality first, and that's by focusing on these workout skills. So number two is going to be speed. Number three is what we would describe as range of motion, which means the distance that you're shortening and lengthening the muscle, the movement pattern that you're going through. And so the rule of thumb here is simple. Move through a full range of motion as long as it's pain free. Now the exception to this would be someone who's working around an issue. Maybe you've got a joint issue and we're doing some time static holds where we're just holding the weight in one position for a minute to a minute and a half. That would be the exception. You're just not moving. You're st we, that's why we call it static contraction or static hold. <clears throat> Everyone else should be moving through a pain-free range of motion and contracting the muscle as far as you're capable of contracting it without being in pain and then stretching the muscle, lengthening it. So generally our clients are pretty good with this. They're usually pretty consistent with working through that productive full range of motion, but we want to be doing that. We don't want to be suddenly just shorting the repetition because we're fatiguing and we're not working at a high level of effort. So full range of motion, pain-free range, and or static holds if we're working around issues with you. And that again will be on your workout chart. Your trainer will be able to manage that with you. And then lastly, from a skill standpoint is the transitions or what we call turnarounds. This is when you're changing directions with an exercise. So if you're doing the chest press and you're pushing up, you're getting to where your arms are almost straight, that's the top turnaround. You wanna come out of that slowly and not speed up as you're changing directions. And the bottom turnaround is at the bottom of the stretch when the weight is going to touch the weight stack behind you. That's also a turnaround and then you wanna move slowly out of that bottom position. So the temptation here is to go quickly at the top and move fast out of the bottom. That tends to increase momentum. It tends to make the exercise harder. Again, this is not a competitive sport. It's not a contest. You're not getting paid to do more repetitions. No one's giving you a trophy at the end of the workout. We simply want to challenge and stimulate the target muscle as safely as humanly possible. That can be achieved by complying with safe, consistent, slow turnarounds, top and bottom. So what have I said here? Take the emphasis off of your performance, put the emphasis on the workout skills, and this allows us to be prioritizing quality movement over volume, which is really the essence of the strength workout. So that's action step number one. Focus on skills, not volume and performance. Number two, living an active lifestyle. With this one, what we want you to do is build minutes, not miles. Now, some of you have heard me talk about this in the past. It wasn't until 2008 that we had formal physical activity guidelines here in the United States. And then those guidelines were updated in 2018. And so in the second edition of those guidelines, a surprising recommendation was made based on the best evidence we have around physical activity and health benefits. And that is there is no minimum requirement from a volume standpoint for benefiting from living an active lifestyle. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, historically, people have always thought about getting out and going for a bike ride or a, a swim or a jog or a walk or whatever it might be, whatever the activity is that you're choosing to do. And they would think of it in terms of big blocks. I have to do a 30 minutes or more. I have to do 45 minutes, whatever they may be trying to accomplish. And that's really been turned upside down. When we look at the evidence here in these most uh, current guidelines, in 2008 they were updated, they're saying, the science is telling us that even really small bouts of physical activity can be meaningful. And so what we're arguing here is you don't have to do an activity for an entire 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, whatever it might be that your objective is, you can do it in small bits and pieces and build minutes throughout the day to get to your overall goal of X minutes per day. So what is that number? How many minutes am I really recommending on a daily basis? Well, again, just looking at the 2018 guidelines, 
what they're telling us is that for moderate intensity physical activity, what I would call a brisk walk, if you get out and you're taking a walk, uh, not sightseeing, for a lot of us not walking the dog, that is often a too slow of a pace, but a brisk steady state walk of at least 20 minutes a day, seven days a week. So this is equating to about 150 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity on a weekly basis uh, to achieve meaningful health benefits. Again, it doesn't have to be walking. It could be any other moderate intensity activity that you choose to do. It could be biking or a lot of different options here. But 20 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity per day, seven days a week, or you can tick that number up and have lower days and higher days. It doesn't have to be 20 minutes exactly, seven days across the board, but we're going for a total of 150 minutes of accumulated planned physical activity per week to achieve these health benefits. What about vigorous physical activity? Actually, let me back up for two seconds. So 20 minutes a day, 150 minutes a week, basically that's 21 minutes a day. Um, what you can do here is you can build minutes, right? I just said that. So you might do seven minutes in the morning, you might do seven minutes at lunch, you might do seven minutes after dinner. However you break it up, you can break this into very small incremental bouts to achieve the total. So you don't have to do it in one continuous block. This is an important message, guys. I can't tell you how many people over the last 30 years that I've met with have believed that they have to do it all at once. You can build those minutes during the day, again, at that appropriate intensity not sightseeing, not a super slow walk with your dog. We're talking about getting out at a brisk pace and moving your body through space. What about vigorous physical activity? The good news, it's less. Just like with strength training, the harder your work, the less training volume you need. Same thing with these types of activities. So for vigorous physical activity, the guidelines are suggesting 10 minutes a day of vigorous physical activity. So if you're doing something like running or you're on a Stairmaster or a step mill or a more challenging activity, an elliptical trainer, 10 minutes is the recommended minimum threshold. So we're basically half. So if you do that, again, you can treat it the same way. You don't have to do it all at once, although 10 minutes is probably fairly doable to bite off all at once. But you could do five minutes now, five minutes in the evening. I can say that I frequently break up my physical activity during the day. Historically, I always did larger blocks of activity, but in recent years, for a lot of different reasons, I'm breaking it up into smaller pieces of 15 to 20 minutes for me. But again, look at yourself, look at the minimum recommendation, at least 20 minutes a day or 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity activity, or 10 minutes a day or 75 minutes a week of vigorous physical activity. But I think the take home message that's most noteworthy here is that there's no minimum amount required to benefit. So if you literally wanted to do this as it's being presented, you could say, I'll do a minute of hard activity. Then a little later, I'll do another minute. You could literally do that. There's still physical benefits to doing that. So break it up in a way that accommodates your schedule and your routine so that this becomes a doable part of your normal lifestyle. And then lastly, let's talk about food for a second. This is, of course, one of the most confusing topics in the history of modern medicine. Uh, my recommendation on action step number three is that you focus on food, not nutrients. Focus on food, not nutrients. What do I mean by this? We have become obsessed in the United States with macronutrients. We usually refer to these as macros. What are your macros today? What macro ratio are you going with? What's the percent of carbohydrate to fat to protein? And so we've gotten so caught up with this, we've lost sight of what really matters here, which is quality food. If we look at the healthiest societies on the planet today, look at the healthiest groups of people around the world, these we can refer to as blue zones, if you know about blue zones, there is huge variation in the macronutrient distribution in these people's diets. Some of them are consuming very low fat diets. Some of them are consuming very high fat diets. And so what we're seeing is that it's not the macro distribution here that matters when it comes to health. What we also know is that the most current dietary guidelines 
uh, published by the Department of Health and Human Services, have also shifted towards recommending eating patterns. Remember the days back in the 80s and 90s when those guidelines included specific percentages and ratios, and, and that really is an outdated way to think about your nutrition. We now know that there's no magic percent of fat. There's no magic percent of carbohydrate in your diet that, that leads to better health. There's wide variability here, and evidence continues to tell us that. A 2019 study that was the first of its kind published by the National Institutes of Health and Dr. Kevin Hall, who was the lead investigator on this study. This is the first study of its kind ever done. They looked at this issue of macros. They gave a group of people the same macro distribution in their diet as the intervention group did. The only difference between these two groups was that the kinds of foods were different. One group ate a diet of processed foods, something that the standard American diet includes a lot of, the other group was given unprocessed and minimally processed foods, more wholesome foods, apples, fruits, vegetables, etc. cetera. Uh, and the end of a month, not surprising here, guys, if you know anything about nutrition, at the end of a month, eating the same macros, which is supposed to predict weight and health outcomes, eating the same macros had no relationship to what was happening with their weight. Those people eating the wholesome foods, unprocessed foods, lost several pounds in a month. Those who were eating the same macros on a processed food diet gained several pounds. There was about a five pound difference in one month between these two groups eating the same macros. So what we're learning and have been learning and can say with good confidence here is that macros don't matter. It's an outdated way to think about your nutrition now the one macro that we often talk about here is protein, of course, and so we do know that we need adequate protein, and we've talked a lot about that in the last couple of years, and if you need a refresher on that topic, you can always go look at our protein guide, either here in the studio or at our learning center to get some details on how much protein you need. So we're not saying you can ignore protein, but you don't need to micromanage the amount of carbohydrate, the amount of fat, relative to protein to try to get some special health outcome. That's an outdated way to think about it. There is not science to support it. In fact, the evidence that we see around the globe from the healthiest populations in the world, there's huge variability. So this notion is really unscientific and has been displaced with better, more clear, reasonable thinking, which is you can have variability with macros as long as the foods are, are wholesome and unprocessed. So my my take home message here is to focus on the food, but the food should be an unprocessed or minimally processed food. The example I always like to give is, you know, an apple would be a unprocessed food, an apple pie would be a highly processed, in fact, we now refer to it as ultra processed. So junk food in general is all ultra processed, it's all highly processed food. So we're not saying that you can never have the ding dong or the donut or whatever it might be, the hot dog, but minimizing those foods in your diet, emphasizing whole foods as best as you're able to, allows you to not have to overthink and micromanage your diet to be living a disease-free life that gives you everything you're looking for. So, what do we said? Number one, focus on skills in your strength workout. Don't treat it like it's a competitive sport. It isn't. Don't focus on volume. Look at the quality of your movements by prioritizing those four workout skills we talked about. Number two, live an active lifestyle. Go out and use your muscles. That's what they're there for. 10 minutes of vigorous physical activity in small pieces or all at once, or 20 minutes of moderate physical activity in small pieces or all at once to get the benefits that that provides to us as well. And lastly, stop obsessing over the macros in your diet. Stop micromanaging your diet. Eat wholesome, whole foods, minimally processed foods, and you'll live a better, healthier life without driving yourself crazy in the process. Thanks for watching tonight, guys. Few quick points. Number one, this video will be recorded. It is being recorded, and so it'll be available to view on our YouTube channel for those of you who want to go back and view it or share it with someone who you know who's trying to live the strength training lifestyle. You can always send your questions to me directly, Richard, at medfitnessprogram.com. I'm happy to answer those questions for you. 
and you can always get more information about Med Fitness, our strength training studio, at medfitnessprogram.com. Thanks for watching tonight, guys. I hope you're doing well. I look forward to seeing you next month.